Hello and welcome to our pre-recorded service for Sunday 21st of March. This service is brought to you by Calvary Church Brighton. My name is Steve Ellicott and I'm one of the deacons. If you're not a local, Brighton is a city on the south coast of the UK, directly south of London. Our congregation in normal times is about 70 to 80 people. And if you're one of our regulars, then we thank you for joining with us in this virtual way even though we would prefer to meet in person. And if you're not part of our regular congregation, then a particular welcome. I trust you will find something helpful in these extraordinary times. Perhaps like me, you're wondering if things will ever get back to normal, whatever normal is. Even as vaccines seem to give us a way out of pandemic, the vaccines themselves become a scarce resource and old national rivalries resurface as nations compete. How can nations speak peace to nation when each has its own need? And as always in such cases, it is the poorest and the weakest who suffer the most. What should we make of this? First, we need to remind ourselves that even as disorder reigns, there is a God who holds the nations as the dust on the scales. Secondly, we need to examine ourselves individually, as a church, and as far as it lies with us as a nation. After all, it's easy enough for me to mouth generous words. I've had my first jab, and actually I'm one of those pensioners who have done quite well financially after the pandemic. But does that not put an obligation on me to help? As James wrote, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And a bit later he wrote, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? How can we accuse our nation or other nations of selfishness when we know better ourselves? That just becomes hypocrisy. And of course, the third thing we need to do is pray, but to pray not as an excuse for inaction, but rather that we might find ways to help. So let's do these three things now. First, we will remind ourselves of the sovereign God as we sing, who has held the ocean in his hands.
let us turn now to prayer. Father, as we come to you, we acknowledge that you are holy and constant, but we are not. So we come to you as the one who is sovereign and who did not spare his own son to come to our aid. Father, we thank you for the work of the scientists who produce these vaccines and treatments. We thank you for the work of medical staff and all key workers who have kept the fabric of society together and held back the chaos. We pray now for the leaders of nations as national rivalries resurface in the face of scarce supply. We pray indeed that nation will speak peace to nation and will cooperate for the general good. And yet we confess that these national rivalries only reflect the selfishness of our own hearts. Father, stir our consciences to see what we each can do, even if only it is to provide resource for those on the front line. And we pray particularly for the poor and weak, both in our own nation and in the affairs of nations, as we lift up to you the places already torn apart by war or famine, for whom the pandemic is just another layer of misery. But above all, Father, we pray that the message of Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, may shine out at this gloomy time. We turn to your word, reminding ourselves that out of compassion for us, he faced a trial, besides which our trials are insignificant. May we, refine, may we find rebuke that we need, but also peace and joy in your word. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now we'll shortly turn to study your word, study the, the word of God. And our scripture for this evening is Matthew 26, 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, here comes my betrayer. So we're going to look shortly at those words of Jesus. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. But before we do that, we will sing again. We remind ourselves that, that the Lord Jesus Christ came to help us in love and face that terrible trial. We'll sing, my Lord, what love is this? My Lord, what love is this?
Listen to my talks before, you know that I like to speak in the modern style, putting the passage into the context of the Bible narrative and the flow of redemption history. But just for this evening, I'm going to go old school, back to the tradition of some of the great preachers of the past, C.H. Spurgeon, for example. Sadly, I lack the rhetorical skills of that great man, but I'm going to try anyway. Specifically, I'm going to preach to a text just to a few words. And my text for this evening is the last part of verse 39 from our reading. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Why am I focusing on just these few words? Because of all the many pages of Jesus' words that we have in the Gospels, surely these are the most puzzling. The more you think about them, the more questions they raise. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Don't miss the significance of that little word if. To see why these words are so strange, let us compare them with some other words of Jesus. He always insisted on the role of faith in prayer. I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Even more striking is what happened when Jesus was presented with a boy who had an unclean spirit. Jesus answered, asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When it comes to prayer, the word if is just not in Jesus' vocabulary, at least not until Gethsemane. Suddenly Jesus introduces this note of uncertainty. But if that word if is unsettling, what comes next is positively shocking. if it is possible. The possibility raised here is not the possibility of escape. Jesus knew perfectly well that the traitor was coming. He was already outside the city and could easily slip away to Galilee under cover of darkness. Or Jesus could have exerted his power. He'd walked through a hostile crowd before. He'd walked on water. If Jesus wanted to avoid it, all the legions of Rome would not have been enough to arrest him. No, the possibility raised here was of an entirely different nature. What was constraining Jesus here was not military power, but the will of God. 
what is he saying? Didn't the angel tell Elizabeth, for nothing is impossible with God? That's Luke 1, 37. And when Jesus himself was asked who could be saved, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Mark 10, 27. Yet here it seems Jesus is questioning the Father's power. The Greek word translated possible in English is donatos. It refers not so much to a logical possibility as to a matter of power or authority, as an advocate might go to a judge and say, you have the power to send this man to prison, but is it possible you can set him free? But the judge might reply, I'm sorry, but the law is clear. I have no choice. I must impose a prison sentence. It seems that we have an issue here that God cannot resolve even when asked by his beloved son. It appears that there is something impossible for God after all. How can we make sense of this? A hypothetical judge is bowing to a higher authority, perhaps the Supreme Court or the Parliament itself. But God is lawgiver and supreme judge both. There is no higher authority to overrule the father in this matter. So how can God have no choice? Other scriptures do throw some light on this. Referring actually to the risen Jesus, Paul writes, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. The writer to Hebrews makes a similar point. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did that so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. That's Hebrews 6, 16 to 18. Yes, there is indeed something that God cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot deny his own word and nature. One can hardly overestimate this point. It seems that the very laws of physics which God set in place to guide the motions of stars can be bent to let Jesus walk on water. But what is the fundamental truth of life on this planet as it's recorded in Genesis 3.19? Dust you are, and to dust you will return. But it turns out that even this would have a loophole, a get out clause. But whatever this cup is that Jesus refers to, is something so fundamental, so bound up with God's own being, that there is no wriggle room, no space for negotiation. There is no other possibility, for if there was, Jesus would have taken it. God's will must be done. And so a few minutes later, after he prayed this prayer, we read that Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? John 18, 11. So what is this cup? What is it that's so horrific that Jesus would ask the Father to change his mind? We just have this cryptic reference to a cup. What is this cup? There are references in scripture to a cup of blessing, but it can hardly be that. There seems to be only one cup in scripture that fits the bill. Isaiah wrote, this is what your sovereign Lord says, your God who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger. From the, that cup, the goblet of my wrath, you will never drink again. I will put it into the hands of your tormentors who said to you, fall prostrate that we may walk over you. And you made your back like the ground, like a street to be walked over. Or in the Psalms we read, 
In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. This is the cup that Jesus is referring to, what Isaiah calls the goblet of my wrath, of the Lord's wrath. It appears at various times and with various targets in the scripture, but whenever it appears, it has just two characteristics. Firstly, it causes men and women to stagger as if drunk because of the horror of it. And secondly, it always reflects God's anger, God's wrath against sin. So how can the cup be taken from the hand of his people, as Isaiah predicts? Hebrews reminds us, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. As we have said, the laws of physics can be bent at need. But for this law, there is no let out clause. The best lawyer in the world can't find an exception. The wrath of God must fall on the wicked and rebellious world. Of course, we don't like to talk of that or even think of it. Surely the world is not that bad. There's good here as well, isn't there? We mostly get on with our unbelieving neighbours quite well, don't we? We often find them kind and helpful. Well, yes, that's true, but it's not the point. If I have committed murder, the fact that I help an old lady with her shopping just doesn't match up. If we have turned aside from God and declared ourselves morally independent, then the very nature of reality is shaken, as Paul wrote in Romans 8.22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Long ago, God had promised to Abraham, in the fourth generation of your descendants, we'll come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Things were not yet as bad as they could be, but the course of destruction was set. Proverbs tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The world was on a path to destruction as night follows day. But John wrote, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That was why Jesus had come. And this is why the cup could not be avoided. This is why the son came to the world in the person of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus took the cup of God's wrath and drank it down. He did it voluntarily. That is why he had come. Order was restored to a world on the brink of chaos. But what does this mean for you and for me? It means that there is something even more certain than the law of gravity. There's something more clear and certain than the crystal clarity of mathematics. Perhaps I should tell you I'm a mathematician by profession. In fact, there's something more certain than even the certainty of death itself. And that is that without help, we are all, as a race and each of us individually, on a path to destruction. I repeat, without help, we are all, as a race and each of us individually, on a path to destruction. And yet, do we really believe that? I have been a Christian a long time and I ask myself whether I feel that to the depths of my soul. And I have to answer, perhaps I do not feel it as I should. Peter and James and John certainly did not. When Jesus returned to his disciples, he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked. That's verse 40 of our passage. I don't know. Maybe as humans, we're just not capable of feeling that truth in its full horror. Perhaps if we did, it would drive us to insanity. But that's all the more reason we need to take warning. Because Jesus looked into that picture and it shook him to the core. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. 
Even he found it hard to hang on to reason in the face of that insight. Jesus had himself many times warned of the way things are going. Here's just one example. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often have I longed to gather your, your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Most of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, of course, had not murdered anybody. And yet they were on that path to destruction and the city would of course be destroyed in AD 70. In Gethsemane, the full horror of that came upon Jesus and it threatened to overwhelm him because we know that he had to shoulder that horror of God's wrath himself. So as we come towards Easter, we ask ourselves, what is Easter about? It's certainly not really about bunnies and chocolate. Easter comes with a message of hope, but also a warning. Because Jesus said, yet not as I will, but as you will. There was not a way out, but there was a way through. And perhaps at that very moment, the victory was really won. From then on, Jesus was resolute. The message of Easter is that Jesus shoulders all that wrath for us. As Hebrews says, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But Jesus went that way for us, staring into the abyss to view something we cannot even bear to see. So he has looked at it, but will we heed his warning? Nowhere does Jesus even hint that everyone will avoid that terrible place, as some say nowadays. But again and again, Jesus warns repeatedly that only through him is the path to life found. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. That was Luke 6:49. And there are many other passages of scripture of Jesus teaching where he warns us that we need to heed his words and follow him. Jesus feeds, faced the hoa so that we need not, but who will heed his warning? So as we draw our time to a close, let us remind ourselves that he suffered so that we may go free. We shall sing that old hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear. Does it sound sweet to us if we have truly learnt the message, of, the lesson of Gethsemane? Then it should do.
takes the wound and spirit hold and comes each heart oppressed it's manna to the hungry soul and to the weary rest and to the weary rest to name the rock on which I build my shield and hiding place my never failing treasury filled with boundless stores of grace by you my prayers acceptance gain although with sin defiled Satan accuses me in vain since I am God's own child since I am God's own child Jesus my shepherd brother friend my prophet, priest, and king. My Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Weak is the effort of my Cold my warmest thought But when I see you as you are I'll praise you as I ought I'll praise you as I ought With every fleeting breath And may the music of your name Refresh my soul in death Refresh my soul in death We conclude our time with those words of Paul from Romans chapter 16, verses 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So may God bless you at this difficult time.